The boys' lengthy 72-issue 2006-2012 comics run means there's plenty of lore, twists, and characters left out or remixed in the show. So in preparation for the coming season and facts that fans may be unaware of, here's a complete guide to Amazon's The Boys. The Boys, based on the comic series of the same name by Irish comic writer Garth Ennis, was adapted for the screen by veteran TV writer and showrunner Eric Kripke. Before The Boys, Kripke was most well-known as the showrunner of Supernatural. At first, the two shows don't seem to have a lot in common. Supernatural revolves around monsters, religion, and other interdimensional beings, and The Boys explores the human flaws of superheroes. Still, both shows are distinctly Kripkean. Supernatural found success by poking fun at genre conventions, and The Boys is no different. The dynamic between the leads and the way each episode lovingly mocks superhero tropes are the best parts of the show. For good measure, Kripke is an enormous fan of the original comics run and its creator. In a 2019 interview, Kripke told Collider, I'm a huge Garth Ennis fan. I'm a big fan of everything the guy writes. With a genre-tested fan at the helm, it's no surprise The Boys has been such a success. While the creator is an enormous fan of the series, Eric Kripke has also stated that not everything from the comics will make it to the small screen, which is probably for the best. Ennis's work evaluates the hypocrisy and absurdity of institutions, beliefs, and symbols that most societies hold dear, from religion to superheroes. However, Ennis often parodies these sacred ideas with extreme violence, toilet humor, and every other aspect of adult content. It's not exactly TV-friendly. In other words, there's a price to getting the comics adapted for television. The price? Whatever it is, I'll pay it. Even with the leniency a platform like Amazon provides, the comics remain far too graphic to be entirely faithfully adapted for TV. None of this is to say Kripke plans on watering down the gonzo spirit of the comics. Considering everything we saw in Season 1, from botched dolphin rescues to an invisible man getting a shocking surprise in his rear end, it seems Kripke has finally gotten to let loose. The audience's surrogate into the world of the boys is Huey Campbell, played by Jack Quaid. Huey's quest to avenge the death of his girlfriend, who was accidentally murdered by A-Train, is a core part of the show's story. While Quaid does a great job of bringing his character to life on screen, the role on paper had already been cast. When creating Huey, Ennis and illustrator Derek Robinson modeled the character off of actor Simon Pegg. While Pegg is aged out of the party inspired, he still appears on the show as Huey's father and a nod to the work that inspired it all. While Eric Kripke has remained faithful to the energy of the original comics, he also made several creative decisions to reshape the basic plot of the show. One of the largest differences between Season 1 of the show and the comics is the boys' lack of superpowers. In Ennis' original run, the members of the team are aware of Compound V and its power-granting effect from the get-go of the series. Huey is injected as soon as he joins the team, and the boys do some serious damage as a result of their abilities. They have the compound because, unlike the TV adaptation, they're backed and funded by the CIA. Removing that from the television show raises the stakes on the series. The superheroes they're fighting are a much bigger threat, so the audience empathizes and roots for its underdog heroes. It has also kept diehard fans of the original run on their toes, because the boys have less protection. Not to say none of the boys have power. The female, Kamiko, played by Karen Fukuhara, retains her penchant for violence and Compound V given powers on the show as well. Another departure from the comics affects the structure of the series. Ennis' story arcs often revolve around the boys infiltrating and blackmailing groups less powerful and notable than the Seven in an effort to find dirt on Bot's superhero organization. The show, on the other hand, does not introduce the audience to other fully formed superhero teams beyond brief mentions. While the other superhero teams the boys encounter in the comics offer humorous takes on popular franchises, leaving them out of the show streamlines the adaptation. The individual encounters with each group wouldn't work as well in the boys' current eight-episode format. In the comics, the boys' battles with different groups last for issues at a time, often only resulting in major progression for larger overarching stories in the final issues of a given storyline. It's a structure that wouldn't translate well to the dramatic satire Kripke's producing on screen. However, Kripke produced plenty of Monster of the Week episodes on Supernatural, so maybe weekly showdowns with new heroes is in the cards for Season 2. Season 2's cast is expanding with additional characters, including Butcher's best buddy and slobbermouth English bulldog Terror. The most notable newcomer is Aya Cash's Stormfront. In the comics, Stormfront is a lot like Thor, with abilities including super strength, flight, and control over lightning. Unlike the beloved God of Thunder, however, Stormfront is also a Nazi. There's already been some theorizing on the internet about how Stormfront's vile beliefs will be depicted on the show, especially since the creators have opted to gender swap the character. Cash hasn't confirmed whether her character will be a Nazi like her illustrated counterpart or if the show will even include that part of her character. 
However, Kripke stated his motivations for the gender swap during a cable and telecommunications marketing association virtual panel, telling the audience, We wanted to sort of create Homelander's worst nightmare, and his worst nightmare would be a strong woman who wasn't afraid of him and proceeded to steal his spotlight. Adding a character to the Seven who directly challenges the authority of its leader Homelander is a great way to shake up the second season. Season 2 could potentially expand its narrative by exploring the lore of the boys. In the comics, the fight between the boys and the soups originated in World War II, when Army Captain Greg Mallory lost his battalion due to the mistakes of untrained superheroes. The soups were placed on the front lines by the Vought Corporation in an effort to gain a government contract for the superheroes. After World War II, Mallory joined the CIA and made it his life's mission to monitor the soups and prevent Vought from gaining federal support. Along the way, he assembled the boys, starting the narrative of the comics. In the show, Grace Mallory's full origins remain unexplored, and Mallory is also gender-swapped. Like the character she was adapted from, Mallory was a member of the CIA and founder of The Boys. However, beyond her motivations for hating the soups and recruiting Butcher, her actions before the show remain undisclosed. Exploring the original iteration of the team, before Huey joined with Mallory still in charge, could be a great way for Kripke and company to continue to flesh out the engaging and brutal world they've created. While he's had a surprisingly complex arc in the first season, The Deep is a very different character than his inspiration. And we're not talking about Aquaman. In Ennis' series, The Deep is a very minor character, and he generally functions as a punchline because he's the only superhero concerned with accounting. However, on the show, The Deep is used to explore the abuse of power dynamics and sexual assault. Season 1's first episode addresses one of the most controversial moments in the comics, the assault of Starlight. In both the comic and the show, when Starlight first joins the Seven, she is coerced into sexual acts. Kripke and his creative team wisely decided to take the moment and its consequences seriously for its female lead and follower as she gains the strength to call out the Deep. Making the Deep a larger part allowed the storyline the space it needed to be handled seriously, not just for shock value. Much has been made of Carl Urban's strong performance as Billy Butcher. Considering Urban's long career and beloved comics adaptations, it makes sense that the actor crafted such a strong performance. Before Butcher, Urban played a CIA agent in the adaptation of Warren Ellis's Red, Scourge the Executioner in Thor Ragnarok, and he brought his grizzled chin to the definitive on-screen version of Judge Dredd. I am the law. Beyond his roles in successful comics adaptations, Urban has also made a career out of appearing as a character actor in sci-fi franchises. He played the villainous Vako in the Riddick series, and he appeared in the Doom adaptation alongside Dwayne Johnson. He even nailed the stiff mannerisms of Star Trek's Dr. Bones in J.J. Abrams' franchise reboot. All that is to say that Urban's a genre legend, and The Boys is made all the better by giving this veteran character actor center stage. Carl Urban's not the only actor on The Boys with a pulpy genre background. The man portraying his nemesis got his career started the same way. Anthony Starr, whose Homelander performance drew positive notice for the suppressed insanity he brings to scenes, got his major breakthrough in another not-for-network TV enterprise called Banshee. It tells the story of an escaped criminal, played by Starr, who assumes the identity of small-town Pennsylvania Sheriff Lucas Hood. Following Hood's exploits as a criminal sheriff, it's one of the most bonkers shows ever committed to the small screen. The show delivered ludicrous storylines involving the Russian mafia, CIA, and a particularly nasty excommunicated Amish drug dealer. However, it also featured some of the best fight scenes on TV before or since, and a stellar central performance from Star, who wisely chose to play Hood against Type. Instead of being a zany criminal or a strong and silent warrior, Hood is a man barely clinging to reality due to the trauma he's experienced. Each scene he's in plays like an interaction with a caged animal. He's defensive, on edge, and clearly fighting against the circumstances presented by his current situation. That experience has worked wonders for him and Kripke on The Boys. While the comics have plenty of plot twists that the show has yet to reveal, Kripke already surprised fans of The Boys with the ending of Season 1. Spoiler ahead! All season, Butcher Huey and the rest of the Black Ops couch surfers operate under the assumption that Butcher is avenging his wife's death. In Ennis' run, Butcher's wife was assaulted and murdered by one of the Seven. However, in the show, Kripke pulled the rug out from under his audience. In the final moments of the first season, it's revealed that Butcher's wife Rebecca is still alive and has Homelander's son. Both Homelander and Butcher were led to believe Rebecca had perished, and their discovery upends their arcs in different ways. Homelander murders his handler, Madeline Stilwell, and Butcher realizes his sole reason for fighting the Seven was a lie. Both characters are left adrift by the revelation, and fans were left clamoring to see the next season. They won't have to wait long. Season 2 of The Boys premieres on Amazon Prime on September 4th. This is never gonna stop. It's just gonna be more blood and awfulness. That's the f***ing 
game. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.